Yeah. Let me formally welcome all of you to the Hemlock Society uh, meeting for November. Um, we are today focusing on a, an incredibly important topic and one that uh, is going to become more important as we move forward. The title of our, our presentations today uh, or our program today is uh, Death and Dementia. And of course, uh, dementia is something that is uh, more and more a problem in our society. I, I was just looking at the uh, Alzheimer's Association's website. 5.8 million Americans currently struggle with, the, with Alzheimer's, uh, the most common form of dementia. And so uh, they expect that this number is going to get much larger as, as our society continues to age. Uh, so it's a very important issue. And, and our focus, of course, has to do with how, how one achieves a peaceful death once they get this sort of dreaded diagnosis. And so our panel is going to address that issue. And I'm looking forward to hearing from all of them. Faye's going to introduce you to our speakers in just a few minutes because she's going to be moderating the panel today. Uh, but before we get started with the panel itself, I, I wanted to make just a few announcements. Um, and, and I think the first one, just describe the format. Uh, the last couple meetings, we've had a format that's more or less the same, but just for those of you who are new, me, each of our speakers is going to have about five, uh, 10 to 15 minutes to make a presentation, and that'll be followed by a, a Q&A session dealing with the uh, issues raised by that speaker, and that Q&A session will last between five and 10 minutes, and then the next speaker the same, and the third speaker the same, and if there's any time then at the end of the meeting or program, uh, we'll open the floor to questions and answers to any of the panelists, and, and, and maybe even uh, Faye, the moderator, it, would like to chime in on some of those questions as well. So that's the format. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, etiquette, let me say a few words about that as well. The most important thing to remember is to keep your mic muted uh, so we keep background noise and uh, keep your mic muted unless you are obviously a panelist speaking or if you are a person who's been designated to ask a question. And uh, just to remind people, you can ask a question in one of three ways on this program. One is you can uh, use the chat line that's provided uh, by the Zoom uh, uh, program. You can also use the uh, uh, ask a question function that's provided by Zoom. You can get to that ask a question function by clicking on the participants button and you'll see a way to get to the ask a question button. And then if you're a technophobe like some of us, you can just put your hand up in front of your face and wave it madly and hope that uh, Greg, uh, knocks one, of our, too well. <laughs> one of our board members will see you and, and call on you. So those are the three ways you can ask a question. Um, and, and then I guess the last thing I wanted to uh, mention to people was, uh, and this is something it's easy to forget, but those of us who are in the trenches, don't forget it. We are a voluntary organization. And we, um, you know, are happy to bring you the kind of programs we, we do, uh, but we couldn't do those uh, programs without the generations of folks uh, like our members and friends and others. And, and during this uh, time of pandemic, uh, we don't have our little cup back at the back of the room where you can drop a few dollars in. So we ask you to go to our website, which again is uh, hemlocksocietysandiego.org, and there'll be a place there you can, you can donate, um, and we hope you'll do that. And finally, I guess I'll say uh, that we hope you'll consider, some of you will consider uh, remembering us in your trust or your and make some kind of a, a gift to us. And if you're interested in that possibility of even thinking about that, please try and get in touch with Beth Savage. She's an attorney on our board who handles that. And uh, there she is. Right <laughs> And she handles that and she'd be happy to uh, talk to you about that. And you can reach her by going to beth at hemlocksocietysandiego.org. Uh, and if you do that, you'll be one of the early uh, members of uh, something we've recently created at the Hemlock Society, which is Faye's Legacy Circle. Uh, of course, named in honor of our founder and hero, uh, Faye Gersh, who's going to be- I it, but- moderating the program today. So without further ado, since she is moderating the program today, Faye, I'm going to ask you to carry on from here. Okay, thanks, Barry. Sure. Um, 
Today, we're talking about two, I would say, of the most unpopular subjects that I can think of, death and dementia, and talking about them together. Uh, they're unpopular because uh, there's still a taboo about those things, and there's no cures for either one of them. There are volumes of information, as you know, about dementia, particularly Alzheimer's, um, and most put out by the Alzheimer's Association. And you will find out everything you want to know about dementia, but you will not find out how to escape it if you have it. And that's what we're talking about today. That is really our function to give people choices at the end of their lives and not to pretend that the end of life is gonna be wonderful and beautiful and that people should live to the very end of it. There are choices. It's a very fast moving field, this question of what to do about dementia. And we're gonna be talking to some of the leaders uh, of this field. I think everybody agrees that it uh, ends in a downward spir spiral that you can't get out of right now, that the burden on caregivers is enormous that it's actually the most costly disease, leaving, I mean, more costly than cancer because of the caregiving responsibilities. And it is now a virtual epidemic. As Barry said, there are in California alone, 600,000 cases, people with uh, dementia of some sort. Still, uh, we need to find out how you can get out of it. And by get out of it, I mean by death. We hope that the research eventually will produce a vaccine or a cure or, a or a prevention or something like that. But right now, the only way out of it is to die early. And because it's a disease that affects older people primarily, but not entirely, uh, many of those people have uh, concomitant diseases that will end their lives sooner, but many do not. And they spend many of their last years in a nursing home or some kind of institutional situation which many of us would like to try to avoid. Uh, people who chose to end their lives, I'm just thinking of two people that we know about, Robin Williams, who unknown to him until later, when he was too, too late, had Lewy body's disease. He thought it was psychosis. He didn't know what it was that was affecting his, his behavior, his performance and acting. And nobody really knew until he was dead on autopsy that it was Lewy body's disease, which we'll talk about. And Junior Seo, a football player here in San Diego who shot himself through the heart because his mind was going uh, because of uh, related football injuries. So these are terrible ways to die. We don't endorse those ways to die, but we do understand when people are in that situation where they can't think clearly or remember things or start acting strangely that they might want to find out what it is and end their lives. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And our first speaker is Dr. Colin Brewer coming to you from the warm shores, I assume of Spain, ordinarily yeah, living in London. <laughs> is it warm there, Colin? We hope you well, didn't go there. During the day, we're 2000 feet up. So it's a little cool at night, but. Uh, okay. Definitely so not. I don't think you'll need American subtitles to understand Colin. He does speak British, not. but that's okay. Uh, Colin wrote a wonderful book, a wonderful little book that you can get on Amazon very inexpensively, which for some reason I don't have, and I hope you do, Colin, so you can wave it around, called... That at the end, yes. Okay. All right, I'll do it now if you want. Okay, there you are. Yes. Uh, the name of the book, which caught my eye, there it is. Oh, let me not get Alzheimer's, sweet heaven. <laughs> and many of us feel that way. Subtitled, which could be the title for this, this symposium, Why Many People Prefer Death or Active Deliverance to Living with Dementia. Colin's a uh, board member of MDMD, which is My Death, My Decision, a Right to Die group in England. And um, he conducts assessments psychiatric assessments on people who are going to Dignitas or Switzerland to get help to die. We'd like to hear more about that. He also wrote a book with Dr. Michael Irwin, who many of you may remember, I mean, still know, called I'll See Myself Out, thank you. So Colin, Colin and I have been around this fight to die movement for more than 30 years. And uh, what you're gonna hear from him is the voice of experience. So let me turn it over to Dr. Colin Brewer. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and 
using this wonderful technology, which we're all having to get used to. Um, rather than talk about numbers and how many millions of people have got it, I, I think it's easier and more impressive if I just make the point that in Britain, and I think things are probably the same in the States, out, dementia is now the commonest single cause of death. It, it amounts to about something like uh, 12, 13 uh, percent of the diagnoses on death certificates. And it's actually, can you hear me all right? I, something funny has yes. come off my screen. Yeah, um, it's actually probably getting on for twice that because a lot of deaths are put down to pneumonia, which are actually deaths of people in care homes. Um, so as I say, probably getting on for 20, 25% of, of deaths are either due to dementia or in people in the advanced stages of dementia. And studies, public opinion surveys show that people are more frightened of dementia than they are of cancer. And with reason, because cancer, first of all, is often curable. And secondly, if the main symptom is pain, we're quite good at dealing with pain. Uh, not, uh, it's not perfect, and some people do not have good pain control. But for many people, palliative care is a reasonable option. There is no palliative care for dementia. There's nothing that can palliate the symptoms. And the worst part of the symptom is that we, we lose our personalities. Uh, we stop being ourselves, and if we're not ourselves, we can't have the relationships that are based on our being ourselves. And that's what terrifies people. And not only do they dread that happening to themselves, but they dread the stress that it's going to put on their, on their nearest and dearest. So it's, it causes a, a great deal of anxiety. But uh, as Faye says, there's quite a lot that you can do about it. Um, Faye asked me if I give a brief definition of the major types. Uh, Alzheimer's is much the commonest, accounts for about 75% of all dementias. And I'll tell you a bit more about it later. Uh, the next most common is probably arteriosclerotic dementia. That's really the effect of lots of little mini strokes gradually closing down more and more of the brain. But it's quite different. Um, and the prognosis is not quite so bad because sometimes you can uh, effectively treat the, uh, the, the, the things like high blood pressure that, uh, that help to cause it. So although you may get a certain amount of impairment, sometimes it stops for quite long periods. And uh, it's, so it's more unpredictable. So we would call uh, vascular dementia, right, Colin? Vascular dementia, yes, yeah. vascular arteriosclerotic dementia. And it can happen with either blood clots in the brain or, or little bleeds in the brain. Um, but uh, that uh, isn't for, for always quite as bad as the relentless progress of Alzheimer. Um, after Alzheimer, there's a thing called frontotemporal dementia. And then after that, there's Lewy body dementia. And then after that, it's very small print stuff. But they are all basically the same. They all basically cause progressive brain rot, damage to the bits of the brain that make you what you are. And um, the average time from diagnosis to death in Alzheimer's is about seven years. But it can be shorter and it can be, it can be longer. It's very rare. But you can get a fairly good idea of how long it's going to last from the rate of progress in the initial stages. And quite often it's other people who notice the symptoms rather than the patient. And sometimes the very fact of having dementia blocks off the bit of the brain that recognizes that you're not the sort of person you used to be. And that can make it very difficult to help people because they, they may deny that there's anything wrong. But in the early stages, uh, difficulties with recent memory are the commonest problem. And as I say, they're often noticed by, by people close to you rather than the patient themselves. And the uh, Alzheimer's is, uh, is just, uh, say, gradual shrinkage. If you look at the 
the picture on the front of my book. Uh, that's a picture of a, an Alzheimer brain which, where the cavities in the middle of the brain have increased in size, the grooves on the outside of the brain have increased in size, and therefore there's, there's less brain and more uh, fluid surrounding it. So your whole brain shrinks and your personality and memory and ability to take part in life shrink with it. Uh, there's a condition called uh, mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is sometimes it turns out to be a kind of early, uh, early sign of Alzheimer's, but quite often it's just part of the ordinary aging process and it doesn't necessarily progress, but it worries people, of course. But if you have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, uh, about half of cases will progress to dementia. Um, but if they don't progress to dementia, you can generally function pretty well uh, with just the ordinary senior moments that uh, we all have as we get a bit older, at least most of us have. Uh, people are so worried about Alzheimer's that there's actually a, a bit of a problem now with people who are convinced that they got it when they don't. <laughs> And I, I saw someone who came to me about four years ago, convinced that she had Alzheimer's. And it's, it took me a couple of years before I could persuade her that actually she hadn't got Alzheimer's, things were not progressing. Uh, but she was quite anxious about it for, for a while. Uh, as Faye says, there's really no treatment for, uh, for most of the dementias. Uh, if you have vascular dementia of the um, you should get treatment for things like hypertension that can make it worse. But with the main sort of dementia, the, uh, the degenerative dementias, um, there is really no treatment. There are drugs which will slow its progress and, and most people will, uh, will want to use those, uh, but they do not really stop it. There are a few treatable causes of, of dementia because of underlying disease, things like vitamin B12 deficiency and um, even Lyme disease. But if you have an assessment for dementia, all these things should be considered and tested for and, and excluded. And uh, otherwise, um, uh, very, really no treatment at the moment. Not only that, there's not really any sign of treatment, despite a vast amount of research. I mean, I, I go onto Medline pretty well every day and I look up papers under Alzheimer and there are now about 50 papers, new papers every day, which I have to scan through to see if they're relevant to me. And that's gone up from about 30 or so, not, not very long ago. Colin, uh, I, would, I think we should emphasize the importance of getting an early diagnosis yeah. because some of the symptoms of, all, of dementia are treatable uh, conditions that could be uh, ameliorate the symptoms. Like yeah. even a brain tumor would be something to I, have. I think there are two things that everyone needs to do to prepare for dementia. One is to make an, a clear advanced decision well before, well, while you're still relatively young and, and well. And people, sensible people should do that anyway. Because it's not just dementia. It's uh, thing, uh, things like cancer. And you, you want to, it's sensible to tell the doctors how you want to be treated when you're no longer able to tell them your, yourself. And it's particularly important with dementia because uh, you may spend a lot of time with dementia being unable to tell doctors what you, how you feel and what you want. And the other thing to do is that the first sign of dementia, whether you notice it or somebody else notices it, go and get um, thoroughly investigated um, at, at a dementia clinic, or they're often called memory clinics, and you will, at the very least, you get a whole lot of baseline tests, which are very helpful uh, if people want to assess progress, see whether there are any, any problems initially, to see whether there are any signs of disease, and if not, to give you a baseline against which you can judge whether a disease is occurring later or whether it's progressing. And the important thing is to know about it as soon as possible, because then you can make plans because when you've had Alzheimer's for a year or two, you may by that stage have lost the ability to understand what's happening and you may be judged not to have capacity. If there's, if there's time, perhaps later on, we can discuss how, 
what, what that in, involves. But the fact is that in Britain, at any rate, um, most people, certainly most of the indigenous population of Britain, would rather die than live with dementia. There have been a number of surveys. Um, <clears throat> the biggest one was done about uh, 15 years ago. And people were asked, if you, got, if you, if you had severe dementia, uh, which I, I think means if you were in need of 24-hour care, so the sort of the middle stage of dementia, you're not necessarily bedridden, but you, you, you are no longer able to look after yourself. If you got a life-threatening illness, would you want to be resuscitated? And the majority of people said, no, not on your life. I don't want to be resuscitated. And there were some interesting differences. I don't, don't want to take up time by discussing them in detail, but they basically, the differences uh, were, were occurred depending on people's cultural and religious group. Uh, in Britain, I'm afraid by American standards, we're a terribly unreligious nation. We just do not, most British people don't go to church, they don't take religion seriously. And thank God we have no similarity, nothing similar to the extreme right powerful religious movements that you have in America, which I assume is one reason why your laws are, are relatively restricted because you have to get them through uh, some some very obstructive people who have a lot of power. Um, Excuse me, Colin, but you don't have any laws at all in Great Britain. So. No, but at least we, uh, I, we don't have to. We don't have to persuade the, the public. The public is overwhelmingly in favour. Ninety more than ninety percent at the latest point. It's only the members of Parliament we uh, we have to persuade. But I think that is happening slowly. Um, but the. Um, uh, it's quite clear that people do not want to be kept kept alive. In uh, in the Bel in Belgium and the Netherlands and Luxembourg, the Benelux countries, you can actually make an advanced dementia decision that says, when I get to a certain point, I'd like to be have euthanasia. And basically, when that happens, like the case of uh, Mrs. A that you mentioned, we might be able to talk about later somebody slips something into your morning or evening tea so that you go to sleep, someone then comes with a syringe and puts you to sleep for good. The case of Mrs. A was slightly bungled because the, the problem was they didn't give her enough initial sedation. And when they were preparing for the final injection, she sort of half woke up, she was confused. It was all very unpleasant. But it wasn't so much a, a legal problem as a technical one. If they had given her enough sedation, she'd have stayed asleep and uh, it would have looked much less unpleasant. But the Court of Appeal in Holland found that, in principle, the doctor who was dealing with Mr. Zay had done the right thing, or at any rate, she hadn't done the wrong thing. But it did cause a, a, a lot of discussion, which I think on the whole was, was useful. Uh, early dementia is probably, I think, now acceptable in Canada as a, a reason for assisted, uh, assisted dying. Uh, another interesting thing in Canada is that in, apart from Quebec, where all medication has to be administered by the doctor, in Canada you have a choice. In, uh, you can choose to swallow the stuff yourself, uh, as happens in the States, or you can ask a doctor to do it. it may or may not surprise you that literally 99.9% .9 of people say, I'd rather the doctor did it, thank you. They would much rather have the certainty of a doctor there to make sure that nothing goes wrong and to make sure that it's quick. Uh, because um, although most people will go to sleep pretty quickly if they swallow their lethal medication, they can continue to breathe for several hours afterwards, which is very distressing for the relations sometimes for the people who are there. Whereas in Canada, you go to sleep and then your respiration is stopped with another drug and you're dead in five or 10 minutes at, at most. Uh, Colin, um, because our time is running out, maybe you can talk about what you do in Great Britain to end your life. I mean, going to Switzerland. Yeah, uh, other than going to Switzerland, and, and you can only go to Switzerland if you're in the early stages of dementia and, and clearly have capacity. Um, you have two choices. Um, as you do anywhere else. You can either decide to uh, use VSED, voluntary stopping of eating and drinking, which requires quite a bit of, uh, of determination. 
Uh, actually, in Britain, if you end your life with by VSAID, it is apparently not regarded as suicide. So it may be that a doctor who sedates you heavily while you're not stopping eating and drinking wouldn't actually be uh, assisting a suicide. I'm trying to, Michael Owen and I are trying to have that tested in court. Otherwise, you have to join Exit International, Philip Nitschke's group, where you'll find a splendid selection of actually fairly simple ways of ending your life with, with certainty that don't involve uh, either getting real barbiturates or being scammed by trying to get real barbiturates and being sent dud ones. And the simplest ones uh, um, are nitrites. That's not the same as nitrates, but sodium or potassium nitrite, which is used in processing meat and is very readily available and almost impossible to ban, works very quickly. You could probably take it with a, a fistful of Valium as well, just so it get off to sleep even more quickly. Uh, but it does work. It's, it's, it is, it is pretty reliable, very reliable, actually. So you're um, talking about do-it-yourself methods now? That, yeah, doing it, doing uh, it yourself. Uh, going to uh, Switzerland, where it's legal. And, to, uh, and the other method is to use uh, inert gases like nitrogen, which is very easily available. Uh, helium was popular, but it's quite expensive. There's not a lot of it around because people waste it on, on balloons. Um, so I think that's about all I plan to say at the moment. Anything else you want me to cover at well, this if you're, stage? If you're an American, you can go to uh, Dignitas or another organization in Switzerland in, when you have early dementia, and somebody like mm -hmm. you will make an assessment of your capacity. What criteria mm -hmm. would you use to assess capacity? Well, capacity, uh, I think law is pretty similar in most countries. And in Britain, you don't even have to be a doctor to assess capacity. Uh, but basically, you have to understand the nature of the decision that you're making. You have to be able to keep it in your memory for long enough to have a sensible discussion about it. And you have to have considered the alternative. Now, capacity is what is called task-centered um, task or task-related. So you can have capacity for deciding about treatment. You may not necessarily have capacity to handle a very complicated legal estate, for example, but you have to be pretty far gone not to be judged to have, uh, have capacity. There, by the way, you should know that there are at least three organizations in Switzerland. The latest of them is Pegasus, which, uh, though I hate to say it, and don't quote me um, too much, but is, is actually a bit less bureaucratic than Dignitas partly because they're in a different part of Switzerland. It's also specifically designed to deal with English-speaking patients. And um, I, I have assessed one or two uh, people for them, including one or two Americans, not so far anyone with, uh, with dementia. But I they have- I say that there's a downside to using these organizations. That is, there's a lot of paperwork to fill out, if I'm not mistaken. Go well, there's a fair there. amount. Um, uh, Pegasus do try to make it Relatively, relatively simple. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of paperwork just in, uh, particularly if you have some sort of mobility problem, just in getting to Switzerland in the first place. You may need special, special equipment. Even I, I, from Britain, I had people going in in small private planes to Switzerland because it's so difficult to use an ambulance. And but, for us, it's worse because, of course, we have to get there from the United States. And it still costs about ten thousand dollars just for the procedure and the pay the doctors and the rent and everything else. Yes. So if we have better solutions in the United States, we'll be hearing about them now. But, um, but you, you must bear in mind that setting against the cost of going to Switzerland, if you have to go into an institution, you're going to be spending many times that amount. And uh, although. Uh, there's an argument that uh, it's all very unfair that only the rich can go to Switzerland. I, I don't think that's true. I think most people, um, most middle class people have $10,000, $10,000, 10,000 euros available, even if they have to take a loan against their house. If they have a, if they have a car, they can sell it. And usually family members uh, will, will chip in because it's in their financial interest to do so. Just very it's really hard on the caregivers. If, if, if Colin, not. Paul has a question for you. Are yes. there genetic markers that may indicate you may have a higher probability of having dementia or Alzheimer's? Yes, um, they're, 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 it's, 
the easy answer is to say it's all uh, the whole chapter on that in in my book. But there are uh, genetic markers of a protein called APOE APOE four, and uh, it's it, some people there are there is there, there are familial aspects of it. Some people just do have a higher family risk of dementia. The one with the highest risk is a rather rare one called Huntington's disease, which is a particularly unpleasant one uh, because it starts quite early in life. And there, there are markers for that. There may actually be a cure for Huntington's. We're not quite sure yet, but the, with genetic manipulation, it does seem possible to treat it. But otherwise for Alzheimer, yes, there are markers. And there's, there are arguments about whether it's a good idea to know you're at high risk or not. In general, uh, people who find out sometimes by accident, by you know, going online to get um, uh, to trace their ancestors, sometimes get an unpleasant surprise. But the research seems to suggest they don't have any lasting trouble. They get used to it. And uh, it, I think I don't think it's something I would bother doing because I'm well aware of the risks anyway. I think everybody should assume they're at risk for getting dementia. If you if you get to 95, you have a 50% chance of getting it anyway. I thought it was 85, but anyway, mm -hmm. as you get older, the risk increases, and that's a disease of the age. Colin, um, Linda asks, what is the name of the English group that you mentioned? And could you provide a list of ways to end one's life? Well, uh, Exit International is run by an Australian doctor called Philip Nitschke, who is currently, I think, based in Holland. Uh, I think he may be moving house. But you just look, you just Google Exit International. Uh, you pay a modest sum to join and annually, and you get a, a continually updated online book with all the latest um, uh, research. Uh, they do a kind of consumer association assessment of the various methods, including some you know, rather tricky and unpleasant ones. Uh, one method we hardly ever have in Britain, of course, is guns. I, I, no, handguns hand are illegal in Britain, have been for several years, and the only people who shoot themselves on the whole are farmers with shotguns. Uh, <clears throat> but as Faye says, it's not a solution that, <clears throat> that people want to encourage because the idea is at the end of it, you look dead, but not disgusting. It's Could a tragedy imagine? that we have to resort to violent methods if we have dementia. Mm -hmm. We want to get out of it. That's really sad. But and if you uh, if you get the Exit International, it's called the Peaceful Pill Handbook, and it's a very sensible, sober, straightforward discussion of all the methods that you can use to do it to yourself. Uh, you. We have a time for one more question, I think, before we go to Carl, our next speaker. If you go to Switzerland. Will you get in trouble with U.S. authorities? Uh, well, sir, you certainly don't in, in Britain. I mean, I, I don't think you would, because I don't think suicide is a crime, even in the, even in the most old-fashioned states of the USA. It stopped uh, attempting suicide was a crime, still a crime, when I was a medical student in the early 1960s. So it is not illegal to go to Switzerland. Technically, it may be illegal for someone to go with you, but nobody has ever been prosecuted in Britain for accompanying someone to a suicide. And if you go from the States, uh, certainly you yourself will not be, uh, uh, will, will, not, will, will not be prosecuted. You don't actually have to inform the police as, as far as, as, far as the, your local authorities are concerned. It's just as if you died in a mountaineering accident in Switzerland. The, the inquest, all the, the details the bureaucracy is done in Switzerland. Most people are cremated there. It's all part of the deal. Um, so you save money on ex expensive um, forest lawn funerals as well. Um, but if you go to Switzerland, you get a Swiss death certificate, which does not mention that you died by assisted suicide. And I, I don't think you need to report it to the local authority. You just need to tell your, you know, the people who pay your pension and, and, and your and your bank manager. They, they might be suspicious if you have a one-way ticket to Zurich or something like that. Well, you know, you're, let's say you're allowed to go to Switzerland and fall off a mountain or have a motoring accident or have a heart attack. Right. In fact, if I could just briefly tell you, a very good American friend of, of mine, uh, quite well-known physician in the States, who told me a few years ago when I was, last saw him 
that he had early dementia and was planning to end his life because he could write a prescription for himself. <clears throat> in fact, his family, <clears throat> family took him on holiday uh, to Greece and he had a heart attack while he was climbing up a mountain on, in Greece, which actually was, everyone felt was the next best thing to, that could have happened to him. We're going to stop now and there'll be a question period at the end of all three presentations. Yes. And then later you can stay and even talk to our presenters if they're still awake. Colin's in the middle That's of That's all right. I I took it. A, <laughs> I took a, it's, it's what time? And now it's 11 o'clock, right? I had a stiff coffee beforehand, so I'm <laughs> fine for an hour or two yet. Colin, thank you so much. And hold up your book again. It's really a wonderful little book. It's cheap. It's on, it's on um, Amazon. Yeah, I'm afraid it's, it's, at the moment, it's probably only available as a Kindle. Um, uh, I might, if you think there's enough interest, I could try and get a, an American edition published, but you can get it on Kindle. It's, it's, it's not very expensive. Yeah. Um, I threatened to send us 200 copies, but I don't know if we want to no. sell mm. 200 copies, yeah. but it's, it's very good and very thorough and very easy to read and mm. very inexpensive and very up to date. So with that plug, Colin, yeah, thank you very much. Don't go to sleep yet because we'll be back. Okay. Back to talk to you. okay. Our second speaker is Carl Steinberg, Dr. Carl Steinberg, who's had 20 plus years of experience as medical director of several nursing homes in San Diego and also hospices. He is a specialist in geriatrics and hospice and palliative care. Why do we still have Colin and where Carl? Where are you? <laughs> I'm here. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Always good to see you, but now we're talking about Carl. Okay. And um, he's a certified family physician too. He's the editor in chief of Caring for the Ages and is a board member of the American Board of Family Medicine, Hospice and Palliative Medicine, lots of organizations, California Association of Long-Term Medicine, and is president elect of AMDA, which is used to be American Medical Directors Association. Because they have an interesting position on this subject, we will be co coming back to AMDA, I think. And a very popular speaker at Hemlock. We'd love to have you here, Carl. Um, sometimes he comes with his famous dogs, but uh, since they won't wear a mask, we're not inviting them today. Okay, Dr. Carl Steinberg, tell us what's going on with, especially because you deal in long-term care, you deal in people who are institutionalized, many of which, many of whom have dementia. What happens to them? Okay, thank you. Um, and I do have some slides to share, so I'll put those up. But I, I just uh, want to thank you, Faye. Faye's a legend. And when Faye asks me to do something, I always say yes. I've known Faye for, I don't know, 10, 15 years from the San Diego County Medical Society Bioethics Commission, and uh, always happy to, to help out and always happy to uh, present uh, to the Hemlock Society, whether it be in person or uh, via Zoom, and it's uh, I like the Zoom format. You know, I've, I've gotten kind of used to it, and uh, uh, it's been it's been kind of fun in some ways. Although um, I, I'm also kind of a hugger, so I like uh, you know I, I miss the real in-person hugs. Let's see here. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and. Uh, by the way, you, we were talking about jokes. I, I have a great palliative care joke, uh, but I'm not going to tell it right now because I want to get through my material. Um, but remind me if you if you stay afterwards. It's uh, this this particular crowd. I'm sure would really really get a kick out of it. So this uh, this is a big topic, um, you know, dementia and death. And and I've been a hospice medical director since 1995. I like to say before it was fashionable, and a nursing home medical director the same. You know, 25 years. Um, I've seen countless dementia patients die. Um, sometimes it's ugly, sometimes it's not. A lot of times it's pretty benign. Um, and uh, I've seen some very happy dementia patients and I've seen some very miserable dementia patients in spite of my best efforts. Um, and you know, I think it's a matter of personal, uh, personal decisions. But anyway, my topic today is gonna be kind of limited on the long-term care uh, perspective. And I hope you forgive all those initials after my name. I used to, you know, I, I kind of hate when people do that, but I'm a certified hospice medical director, a certified uh, nursing home medical director, and a certified healthcare ethics consultant. Um, so a lot of these slides I poached directly from my colleague and friend, Dr. Stan Terman, who in my opinion is like 
one of the world's foremost uh, authorities on this topic. Um, and I, I would highly recommend anyone who's uh, really interested in formulating a good advanced directive um, about a dementia directive, uh, at least look into some of Stan's work. Um, so advanced dementia, and as Colin said, I mean, it's it's big, right? This is, uh, I don't really, it's not exactly a pandemic. It's, it's not contagious, but it's affected countless lives. And, um, you know, for each life that for each person that has dementia, there are all the family members whose lives it touches. Um, and it's got the, you know, there's a possibility it could overwhelm our, our healthcare system. It's very expensive, the care, uh, medical care and non-medical care. Um, so I think preparing for it is a good idea. And I, I don't, this is preaching to the choir, uh, I'm sure on this particular call um, and uh, doing appropriate advanced care planning that, that has provisions for dementia, um, I think is highly advisable. Uh, and I don't know if some of you are aware, but there's been sort of an attack on advanced care planning in general, uh, you know, in the last year or so, and some very prominent researchers have said, we spent all this money researching advanced care planning and it's never been shown to really make a difference. I can just tell you from personal experience, it, it's so much better when you know in advance what a person wants or what their their beliefs and wishes are. Um, and I suspect everybody or virtually everybody on this call has formulated an advanced directive and named a person to make decisions on their behalf if they become incapacitated. And if you haven't, I, I do highly recommend it. Um, so a little something about skilled nursing facilities. There's about 15,000 of them in the US, about 1,200 in California. Uh, there's, uh, you know, roughly 1.5 million Americans living in nursing homes. They're federally licensed. And when I say highly regulated, I'm, that's an understatement, okay? It's a 700 pages of new regs that came out in 2016. Um, depending on who you ask, uh, it's either the, the most regulated industry in the country or second only to the nuclear industry. So uh, we got a lot of regs and facilities quake in fear of regulatory violations because they have these survey teams that come in and do inspections and write deficiencies and citations. And um, so they're very, very regulated. The coverage for nursing homes is mostly Medicaid or what we call Medi-Cal here. It's a, a sort of for indigent people. So if you have resources, you have to spend down your resources until you, uh, uh, you know, until you get down to basically a few thousand dollars and then, and then it's covered by Medi-Cal. If you're in there to get skilled care, medical care, like after hospitalization, Medicare pays for that. And it's, it pays a much higher rate, but it's, it, it's time limited. But in any event, so there's this sort of dual population in nursing homes, right? There's uh, medically sick people, and then there's just people who need assistance with their activities of daily living. Um, and because our system won't cover, I mean, Medicaid won't cover them living in a little six bed, um, or, you know, small group home board care, they, uh, you know, instead your tax dollars are paying for $8,000 a month in a nursing home when it, instead of $3,500 at a, at a little board and care. So assisted living uh, is also considered long-term care. And these are, you know, they're residential care facilities. That's how they're licensed in California. For decades, they've clung to the, you know, desperately to this we're non-medical mantra, uh, but clearly they take care of sick people, you know, people with significant medical problems uh, and a lot of functional dependence. And these range from the little six bed I'm getting some background noise. I don't know if you guys hear that. That's not coming from me. Um, anyway, these range from small six bed facilities to the big, huge, uh, fancy assisted living facilities. And some of them have nursing staff, either full or part-time, but a lot of them have no nursing staff at all. They basically just have, you know, lay caregivers. They may not even have certifications. Um, and there's no federal regs for these places. So the state regs vary quite a bit from one to the next. So just to give you, that's, that's the background. Now, we're specifically going to talk about stopping eating and drinking by advanced directive, right? And, and here's sort of what has given rise to this. Um, we baby boomers, and probably to some extent the generation behind us, really value autonomy, right? And uh, we want to have it our way. We don't want some, somebody else's death. We want to die on our own terms. And 
I'm sure that if, you know, if you're on this, this Zoom call, you're probably one of those, um, regardless of what generation you're from. And we fear lingering in a state of advanced dementia, right? Uh, we, we do not want a prolonged dying uh, where we're completely functionally dependent, maybe nonverbal, don't even know our own name. Um, and, you know, there's lots of reasons for this. I just listed a few. One probably big one is that you could be suffering and other people might not know it because you can't articulate it. And dementia patients certainly can, uh, even in, in fairly advanced stages, you know, if there's grimacing, you know, there's these nonverbal things that can show you. Um, but you don't always know. And so there's always a chance somebody could have severe suffering and yet they're just sort of, you know, drawn up in a fetal position and you have no idea. Um, then there's indignity, right? You're, you're behaving in a way that's totally not the way that you, uh, you know, your lifelong uh, values would, uh, would have allowed you to behave. Then there's financial, right? Uh, you spend up a lot of money in long-term care, right? Uh, you know, if it's $100,000 a year to be in a nursing home or something like that, um, that's money that could be used for something else. And then also putting your family through this, you know, years and years of, uh, of observing you go downhill and, um, you know, whatever, whatever that trajectory takes, you know, the ugly things that happen as part of it. So some people do choose preemptive suicide. I think that's unfortunate. You know, I, I believe life is precious and I've seen lots of dementia patients um, who seem to be enjoying life um, right up until the very end. So, I mean, I, it's, it's a bit of a value judgment, right? Um, uh, but, but I think ultimately I'm a believer in autonomy and I certainly have certain criteria that I would not want to be sort of forcibly kept alive after I got to that point. So it's no surprise that there have been multiple attempts to formulate dementia directives. And there's quite a few of them out there now. Uh, I just wanna say some of them have flaws that will likely make them unenforceable. So you may get this false sense of security. Oh, I filled out such and such dementia directive. And you think, yeah, when I hit that point, they're gonna stop feeding me, I'll be all set. Um, not necessarily. So, and I'd encourage you to check out Dr. Terman's work if you um, wanna see what some of those flaws are. Here's some of the objections we face. First of all, feeding, right? It's just basic humanity, right? It's kindness, it's nurturance. It's not, I mean, how can you withhold it, right? That's just, you know, it's, it's not a medical intervention. It's not like putting a feeding tube in somebody. It's just taking a spoon to their mouth. But, you know, if you have to take the spoon and be, you know, okay, choo-choo train going in the tunnel, uh, say, ah, you know, um, that's, uh, I don't know, it's bordering on, especially if the person says they didn't want it, they, they wouldn't want it um, at some previous stage of life. I, I think that you, you kind of want to listen to that. Well, can you listen? I, I mean, is it a permissible to write a directive and then have it followed? I think it is. Yeah, I think there's ways to do it. Um, well, I think- Bob Reeves at the end is going to tell us what he's found out, but in your institution, your institutions, Carl, can somebody say, in advance, don't feed, you, you're shaking your head. No, they cannot. Nope. I'll get into that. Okay. But uh, yeah. yeah, but it, it can be done. I mean, if you're at home or, you know, um, if you've got the resources and your family's willing to, to do that, then that's not, shouldn't be a problem at all. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't recommend not offering food, but if you put food in front of the person, they can't put it in their mouth. And they've said, you know, if I reach these criteria, I don't want to be fed. Um, I think you're fine. I, I don't. I don't see a problem. When you're that. in a nursing home and you've an advanced, an advanced directive, if I get to point X, and I guess you have to be fairly specific about what point X is, I don't want antibiotics or surgery or any invasive treatment. I just want comfort care. That's legitimate, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, you can do that. That's no problem. That's, that's really that's, important to do. That is important. Yeah, that's outside the scope of this talk. But uh, I, I hope everybody um, has somebody that's making decisions on their behalf who will say at a certain point, I don't want anything done to, to prolong my life. You know, I don't want any medical interventions to prolong my life. I don't want IV fluids. I don't want to go to the hospital. Um, anyway, here's another one. The person with dementia that you have now turned into is a different person than the one you were when you filled out these documents. Uh, you know, uh, people, you know, really kind of cling to that. They're like, um, you are no longer the, the same person. And then, but the second part of that, people change their minds. That's very true. People do change their minds. 
people, you know, some of you sitting on this call might say, oh, if I ever got pancreatic cancer, I would just be, you know, I wouldn't take any chemo. I'd be gone so fast. But then lo and behold, you get the diagnosis. You're like, mm, yeah, I think I will take that chemo. You know, I'm not in that big a hurry to check out. Um, and, and people change their mind in the other direction. You know, people might say, I want, I want my life prolonged to the last possible instant. Then they get a, a terrible diagnosis and, and suddenly they say, no, maybe I really don't want uh, to prolong this, right? So people do change their minds. So, uh, you know, if somebody's saying, please give me food, please give me food, but they can't figure out how to get it in their mouths, you know, are you gonna, with, are you gonna not feed them? I don't know, right? Did that person actually change their mind? I mean, is, does their mind, if they, they're, they're sort of clamoring for the food, either non-verbally or something, very complex ethical issues. So, and I don't have the answer to that question. Um, here's another one. When in doubt, err on the side of life. So how can you be sure this person doesn't want to be fed? Look, they can still swallow. If I put the food in their mouth, they swallow. Um, you know, it would be wrong not to give them the benefit of the doubt. But of course, then you're forcing them to, to prolong their dying process, essentially. And then the disability community, they are so rabidly against this because they feel that it devalues um, the life of a cognitively impaired person. And they seem to fail to, to get that this is like a personal individual decision. Um, but I think there are fears that, that when you do start to devalue that on a, on a widespread basis, that it could lead to policies that uh, uh, might uh, lead to poor care or, or you know, judgments against people who, who have other disabilities, like just uh, developmentally delayed people and things like that. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm president elect of this medical society, right? And I, I, I differ in opinion with our policy. So um, we passed this policy in 2019. Essentially anyone living in a long-term care setting, even if they have an advanced directive saying, don't feed me and I wanna do, um, I wanna stop eating and drinking by advanced directive, it should not be followed right? Unless the person is, is like clenching their mouth shut or, you know, pushing you away or that kind of thing. In that case, yes, you can, uh, you could, you can then stop feeding them. But short of that, if they assent to it, even if you have to coax them to open their mouth and, you know, take some uh, three minutes to swallow one bite, uh, the, the recommendation is to keep feeding them. I disagree with that. Um, and it's, it's kind of paternalism, right? And you're familiar with this notion, right? Uh, back in the old days when the doctor just used to say, you know, you're going to do this. And the patient said, yes. Um, paternalism also, you know, back in the, in the sixties, um, 90% of doctors in a survey that I think was done in JAMA or one of the big journals said they would not tell a patient if they had uh, a, um, like a metastatic cancer diagnosis, uh, like, because it would be harmful to them to know, you know, and, and just, crazy, right? Now we've changed over the years. Nobody, nobody's withholding that kind of information now. But um, so there's this notion of soft paternalism versus, versus hard paternalism. Soft paternalism is if you're not really sure um, why the pay, you know, why a certain decision is being made, you want to push in a certain direction, or if you truly believe that a patient didn't know what they were, you know, the decision that they made, and, and you might want to sort of exert your influence uh, in a different direction. Hard paternalism is basically saying, I don't care what the patient thinks. I, this is what's right. And this is what's going to happen. And, and we still see that sometimes. Um, and really this AMDA policy is, is an example of that. But I mean, you might see like trauma surgeons, right? They don't care if somebody has an advanced directive. They, you know, once they're on that treadmill, they're going to go in there and stabilize the spine and that sort of thing. And, and I, I, I'm very much against that. I, I think we have to listen to, uh, to what our patients tell us they want. So let's okay. just say to summarize, if you wanted to get out of the nursing home, not go in there in the first place, you would, we, our, our choices are very limited because our death with dignity laws do not permit, um, it, uh, do not permit hasten death for people who are not competent or who are not terminal. So that's sort of out. Uh, Rob will talk about Final Exit Network as a way out. And we talked about VSED in advance, so you don't have to wind up in a nursing home, but then you lose a good quality of life. So if you wind up in a nursing home, this 
uh, advanced directive to not do anything to you still will be valid, but to do V said or said AD, you call it stopping eating and drinking advanced directive, probably will not work. And that's what Rob Reeves is going to talk about next. Right. And, and what I would say is, yeah, I mean, short of this, I, you certainly want to have um, like pulsed orders, pulsed paradigm orders, uh, um, not just an advanced directive, but but actual doctor's orders that say no, you know, no antibiotics, no hospital transfer, no IVs, no CPR, no tube feeding, right? That kind of stuff. Very um, important question. Am I running out of time, Faye, or I'm okay? Yes. Can I have a question? Question. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm 94 years old. I live in a retirement community. I have the post advanced directives and a special document that says, if I have dementia, even though as a rational person, I have said no food, no water, even if I recover. My advanced directives say, even I have dementia and I request to be fed and to have water, please do not give it to me. And that will be honored. Do you agree? Probably not if you're in the US. I mean, um, that's like a Ulysses contract, right? That says, even if I say, please feed me. And not only that, it's probably not gonna happen even if you don't say, uh, don't feed me. I, I, I mean, even if you do say, please feed me uh, there, because, if you're still able to take it by mouth, they're going to still keep putting it in your mouth. Now, if you start clamping down, then they won't probably. I don't agree with you. That sucks. If yeah, I agree. I, I, I'm totally with you. I, I think and I have said, I don't want food and water. You have to honor it. You have to honor the person who was rational and not the person who is irrational. Natasha, that's not talking about it. Yeah. Have you talked to the people at White Sands about this? Yes. And they all agree. I they were not. I will not force you to have food. Do okay. not feed me and, and give me water, even if I request it. Okay, that's you're very fortunate. So you're you must be in an assisted living, not in a nursing home. I'm independent right now, but we have assisted living hospital and dementia here. Okay, all right. Well, um, I, I got a couple of slides at the end, but basically, in a skilled nursing facility, very very unlikely to happen. In assisted living, you know, if you got the right place, and it sounds like you did. Um, then it, it could happen. Yeah. Um, These are continuing care residential oh, community. Yeah. yeah. Quite um, all right. So I'm just going to um, talk about the four principles of bioethics just because I think it's, it's fun to have a look at this through that lens. Um, so uh, if a doctor fails to follow these orders uh, or, you know, that are in an advanced directive or, or fails to issue orders that are consistent with somebody's advanced directive, obviously that's going uh, against the person's autonomy, right? You're basically changing what the person said, which is don't feed me when I, when I um, meet these criteria and uh, basically not respecting their right to self-determination, right? Um, so that's, that's a clear breach of autonomy. Um, also, beneficence, right, which is doing good. Uh, if you impose additional criteria or, or, or uh, force people to um, continue eating, even though their advanced directive says they would not have wanted to continue eating at that point, basically, that violates beneficence because you would be doing good by allowing them to die sooner, right? Um, you're basically prolonging their dying process. And because of dementia and the way it progresses, um, they will not be able to enjoy those years, most likely, uh, once they've reached the criteria that they felt designated significant suffering or that they would not want to be kept alive. Non-maleficence, right? This is all the old first do no harm. Um, so prolonging the dying process prolongs and often may increase suffering because what happens when people start uh, with advanced dementia, it's harder and harder to get the food in them. So they start to develop malnutrition. And then what happens when you get malnutrition? You wind up with bed sores and things like that. So, um, and contractures, right? Whereas if you just stop eating and drinking right off, you know, completely, you're going to be gone in 10, 14 days, something like that. And, and you can be medicated for that. Um, and, and then also, as I said before, we may not always know if a person with advanced dementia is suffering. And so we may not even treat it or we may not give, give sufficient treatment for that. So basically, 
we're violating first do no harm um, by, by ignoring somebody's advanced directive that says don't feed me. And then justice, right? The, there's a, this is kind of a notion of social justice. Um, when you prolong the dying process, um, obviously somebody's living in a facility, there's all those costs of care and these facilities are very expensive. Um, and even though you would never have wanted to expend those, maybe you wanted to leave that money to your grandkids so they could go to college or, um, you, you know, instead of uh, losing your house, you, you, you know, you could have left it to a family member or whatever you wanted to do with your estate. Um, by the time you get to this point, you can't appreciate that. Um, but you did not want to be kept alive. And so, you know, it kind of violates that principle of justice as well. So I think it's an exceptionally ill-advised policy um, to basically ignore a person's advanced directive. And part of the reasoning for AMDA's policy, it was painted as, um, you know, this is, it's ageist, right? It, it's, uh, you're basically um, discounting the importance of these, these de patients with dementia's lives. Um, and I disagree. I think it's, it's the person's own decision as to what happens to their body. But you can see where, where some people find that controversial. Um, and I, I just want to say this is an equity issue, right? Because if you're somebody that, that has resources, you know, you can go somewhere else. You can, you can have this done at home. You can have your family look after you. Uh, but if you are a, a person who's indigent and you're living in a nursing home on Medicaid, this isn't going to happen. That you're going to be stuck. So the bottom line. Uh, Don't go to a nursing home. Well, I hate to say that because, and I, I'm sort of biased. I I work in nursing homes. I think they are so much better than they used to be 20 years ago. Um, they why are not. Anyone, what, why would anyone in their right mind go into a nursing home or a hospital? <laughs> okay, well, I'm sure there's a lot of people on this call who have those sentiments, but but truly, I mean, they're not bad places. And, and I, you know, I bet a lot of you have told your kids, whatever happens, don't ever put me in a nursing home. That is really a toxic thing to say to your kid. I mean, because then you wind up going to a nursing home and they're going to feel guilty the rest of their lives. And you have some giant stroke. Um, and I, I know some of you probably have plans for if that were to happen, but but just don't say that to your kids. If you ever said it to your kids, take it back, please. You, you don't want to put them through that. They're not going to put, they know you don't want to go to a nursing home. Uh, you know, if they put you in a nursing home, it's going to be because there was no other option. But anyway, that's Carl, a sign. Stan, Stan Terman would like a word. Oh, okay. Stan, hi. Thank you. Um, a word. Yeah, yeah. Let me finish, Stan, let me finish. And then you Absolutely. Can... Okay. <laughs> what time is so, over? Because this is my last slide. So if you're in a nursing home and you think you can do this, I think it's highly unlikely in the foreseeable future for that to happen because of the, the, the fear of regulatory actions and the fact that nursing homes are very focused in. And Stan and I took care of a patient some years ago um, who, was, who wanted to do voluntary stopping eating and drinking and they totally sabotaged her. You know, they'd go in there, oh, would you like some ice cold lemonade? And it took her like 40 some days to die because they kept, you know, uh, which was really, really wrong. Um, that's different from a dementia patient. But in any event, I don't think that'll happen. If you're in an assisted living, depending on where you are and how much support you have, you may not be able to do it, but maybe you can. And there's that story of Susan Saren. Yeah, we, we were, sorry, we're out of time, but uh, and okay. if Stan's gonna say something, it's gotta be short, Stan, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if you're gonna do this, make sure you get hospice involved. Whoever you're, Whoever's making decisions for you at that point, Get, get you on hospice so that you can be medicated through this. And obviously, if you have the resources, a private home or other non-institutional or congregate setting is, uh, uh, is recommended. And here's Stan's here's information. Some very good um, websites for you. Stan, can you uh, make it short? Of course, I'll try. <laughs> I, I have two, one comment that relates to Colin's Brewer's wonderful book and uh, very personal and detailed. And another relates to what Carl was saying. Um, do I not have my video on? I can you see me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Here, good. here let right. me stop. Let me stop my screen sharing here so you can be big. All right. Okay. So, um, like many people, Colin has offered a uh, advanced directive. Like many directives, it is flawed. It just take me a minute to indicate why it's flawed. 
first of all, he the living wills must say two things, the when and the what. So when I am unable to make or communicate decisions about my medical treatment, this is not a, a definitive timing for advanced directive, uh, for, for when you want to implement your advanced directives. And the what is what intervention you decide to intervene. And that is, I refuse food and, and or drink by mouth if I refuse repeated attempts to feed and hydrate me. You may very well, out of habit, out of reflex, say or grunt, give me the food, uh, 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 as you point to the food in front of you and you, your living will says, don't because you're suffering and it can't in so many ways. So this is an inadequate uh, living will, ineffective. I want to make an offer to it that's on my website. We evaluate living wills for free. We give you comments such as just, this is an example and uh, there's no obligation. And so if you want to say, okay, am I living in a false sense of security? We will answer that question. And, yes, and the last you. statement I want to make I, is I, that I have a strategy <laughs> that uh, can uh, make it, a, it's a Ulysses contract, is very different from a request. You can say, hey, if I reach this, like the uh, like end of life Washington and compassion and choice and so forth, they say, if I reach a certain stage and I've changed my mind, don't listen to me. This is merely a request about a request. In order to put legal teeth into this, 30 seconds, what you need to do as a capacitated planning principle is to see a variety of people and sign the forms so that you waive your future legal right to have your proxy agent be the one in control, a bilateral contract, which is irrevocable, which is another word for Ulysses. And then it doesn't matter what you say, you can't and change your mind. And we're your proxy agent <laughs> will uphold your um, living will. Thank you for letting me finish. Now we're gonna hear from a lawyer about this very subject who hasn't yet another living will, another advanced directive on this subject, and that's Rob Rivas. Uh, Robert is the um, general counsel for Final Exit Network, a 15-year-old national right to die organization, which provides personal information and support to seriously ill people who are considering a hasten death. And I hope, Rob, you'll say a little bit about uh, how Final Exit Network helps people with dementia. He's also a partner in a private law practice in Tallahassee, Florida, where he is now. And we first met in 1998 when he defended the right of an AIDS patient in Florida to uh, assisted death, which went to the Florida Supreme Court. So he'll talk about a special advanced directive prohibiting spoon feeding for incapacitated patients, which is what we're talking about, and the role of Final Exit Network in working with people with early dementia. Rob, are you still there? <laughs> Thank you, Faye. Um, I just want to mention, incidentally, I, I just can't resist mentioning this, that I, with my uh, current wife, I eloped in 2011, and Faye was the only witness to um, <laughs> to our <laughs> to our marriage. <laughs> so she serves a special <laughs> she has a special place in our lives. Um, so first of all, I guess I'll talk about the fact that Final Exit Network does provide exit guide services to uh, persons who are uh, still competent but who confirm that they have dementia. So let me back up and tell a little bit about uh, uh, Final Exit Network. It dates back, its origins date back to the Caring Friends program that uh, Faye was one of the people who founded that and, um, and then later also participated in the founding of Final Exit Network. But it eventually, the Caring Friends program eventually was uh, uh, strangled and out of existence and the uh, uh, organization became Compassion and Choices and a number of people who were part of the Hemlock Society antecedent to Compassion and Choices formed Final Exit Network. And we like to say that uh, Final Exit Network is the true and real uh, successor to the Hemlock Society. 
But in any event, the object of the, of the thing dating back to the program, dating back to, to the Caring Friends program is that a group of people would volunteer to go to the bedside of people who are screened in advance so that it doesn't just become a suicide on demand program. It, it's for people who are suffering um, and provide people well in advance with a complete education to make sure they know exactly how to properly conduct a helium uh, or in these days, nitrogen, an inert gas uh, death with a, an exit hood. Um, Final Exit Network does that to this day everywhere in the country. And after years of grappling with the, the issue of dementia, uh, some years ago, Final Exit Network established a policy that uh, it was an exception to the usual rule. The usual rule is that a person has to have, have has to have been suffering from a, a irremediable suffering irremediable irremediably and to qualify for exit guide services. And this was the one exception that the person who is imminently threatened with the loss of selfhood through dementia will be accepted into the exit guide program uh, of Final Exit Network. So they can choose to uh, to to die at a point in time before the dementia progresses past the point where they're competent. Of course, that's a terrible thing to have to think about. It's a terrible thing for anybody to have to think about because they're then, uh, they're then going to end up knowing that they left some good time on earth on the table, so to speak, because they have to act, uh, they, they can't act too late. Final Exit Network won't participate in any uh, kind of support services for anybody who is not fully competent at every stage, including the last breath of the process. So people who are uh, deep, too deeply into dementia to call them uh, capacitated uh, can't, can't receive exit guide services. And so they have to go the rest of the way uh, until they die with dementia. Um, Anyway, we do offer that service and it, people do avail themselves of it. And that's one of the options that Final Exit Network uh, uh, makes available. Another one is a new program that was initiated uh, this year, the, the best possible year for new programs to be initiated. <laughs> we, uh, we started what is called the, the uh, Supplemental Advanced Directive uh, for Dementia Care Program. Now, as you all know, um, the, the uh, advanced directive for dementia care that, that, that specifies that one would like to have VSAT and discontinue being uh, uh, fed and watered manually because of dementia is um, uh, not necessarily enforceable. I prefer to say we haven't yet established its enforceability, and that's what we're about trying to do. Um, the uh, uh, first criterion to participate in the SAD program and sign up for the uh, Supplemental Advanced Directive for Dementia is that the person have a really good uh, uh, surrogate. Same thing as a healthcare agent uh, same thing as a proxy, uh, just different laws in different states and different usages. But a surrogate is what I, I call them. I prefer to call them. The surrogate has to be somebody who's who's uh, on board with the SAD program and is aware uh, of the potential necessity to be very uh, uh, be very committed to to difficult advocacy in the face of opposition on behalf of this patient. And so the, the patient is required to have a valid advanced directive under the law that the patient lives, patient lives in when the documents are executed. So a standard advanced directive or what I'll call your general advanced directive needs to be in place in case the SAD fails legally. But in addition, the, the SAD doesn't cover the basic elements that are covered in a general advanced directive. And also, normally, an advanced directive uh, 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 contains the appointment of the surrogate, and that's essential to the for, to the uh, 
to the SAD program. Um, the surrogate will talk with me in advance and um, I'll be available at no charge. None of this is exit guide services and the SAD program, there's no charge for any of it. Um, I will be prepared to talk the surrogate through the process and provide any legal representation they may need. Typically, it'll begin it, just the way normally these kind of legal uh, battles begin brewing is that the uh, healthcare uh, institution will uh, refuse to carry out the terms of the SAD, which specifically calls for a discontinuation of uh, uh, manual hydration and feeding. And um, when that takes place, the surrogate calls me and I will call, typically I'll call the lawyer for the institution that the patient is in and jawbone lawyer to lawyer about it and um, try to convince him that he's failing to give the correct advice under the circumstances and that he needs to reconsider, the institution needs to reconsider its legal position and follow that if it doesn't work um, with a very detailed letter. So it's clear they understand why we think that they're mistaken so they can fully think about it and then sue them. And um, we wanna do that and we wanna enlist people in advance who are prepared to be participants in this litigation program precisely to help develop law, push for the law in the area of uh, advanced directives being lawfully used to demand a discontinuation of manual hydration and feeding. That's the ultimate goal is to initiate the litigation, set the precedents and start contributing to the movement of the entire field in the direction of allowing uh, VSED by advanced directives. Now I know uh, uh, some people who are familiar with this subject hear me say VSED by advanced directive and one of the criticisms of the way that we've characterized it as being a VSED by advanced directive is that, is that the word voluntary is in that VSED. It's voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. And since the patient is demented, the patient's actions at that time can't be voluntary. But I believe that the correct legal analysis someday will be if we succeed. Uh, that it is voluntary if the person who, when the person was competent, the person insisted on it. Um, there is no other person when the person is demented. There's me and I am demented at that point. And I had the capability of filling out an advanced directive and signing an advanced directive when I was competent. And in any other situation, the advanced directive would uh, be honored with regard to other things that are perfectly legal. All we want to do is move uh, be set into the category of things that it's perfectly legal to do, to to require in your advanced directive, and uh, so that's the uh, supplemental advanced directive for dementia uh, initiative that Final Exit Network has lost or uh, initiated. So I'm happy to answer you're any you're questions. Willing, you're prepared to go to court to make sure that these what they call said ads stopping eating and drinking advanced directives will be honored in the institution the person is in, even though, as Carl said, right now they won't be honored. So you have a tough battle on your hands, right? I, I don't think Carl said that they won't be honored. I think he said that in a lot of institutions, particularly nursing homes, it's going to be a, a difficult and in, in, in many of them you'll find opposition, but uh, I don't think you ruled out the possibility, particularly in, in an in assisted living facility, that, uh, right. that some of them would actually cooperate and participate in in, uh, in a VSED program. Uh, by the way, I often think about, uh, and I'd be eager to hear from Carl right now on that, but I often think about uh, uh, whether to change the name of it to SED by AD, because some purists and with the language think that it's wrong to call it voluntary because it is addressed to a person at a uh, person's circumstances at a time when they're not capacitated but um, i'm going to stick with my legal theory that it's voluntary because it was ordered by the patient and, and uh, if i could just comment yeah i mean amda used the term sed by ad just for that exact reason I, i'm not sure it makes a big difference uh 
on that. And actually, you know, it would be lovely if a facility refused to do it and then we had a case to test it, right? Uh, I, I'm pretty sure nursing homes are just gonna flat out not, not follow it. But whether it's a nursing home or an assisted living facility, um, it would be nice to test it and, and uh, let the courts decide. There's just been some kind of uh, concerning court rulings lately, right? Like the New Hampshire uh, Supreme Court uh, where they're, they're basically saying, now the person's best interest as determined by the court should overrule what the what a surrogate said and and so uh, just a little scary on that but but it'd be nice to test it the whole legal landscape has become very scary on these kinds of issues and uh, with the newly configured supreme court of the united states progress may end for a generation this is a red hot legal issue right now and it the Nevada, Nevada statute has helped a little bit. Can you talk about that, Rob? Yeah, in Nevada, the, it just came like a, a, a gift from the sky. It was totally a mystery how, how it took place. Well, Nevada enacted a law that, that had new language regarding advanced directives. And somehow it, 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 in a form, it doesn't say it in part of the statute, but in a form, a form suggests that you can choose to uh, refuse uh, manual hydration and feeding uh, when you have uh, dementia or at any other time in, a, in an advanced directive. So uh, there the, you have, I, I don't have seen reported an instance of it being utilized. The sad form that you have on the Final Exit Network uh, webpage <coughs> that you referred to I hope uh, incorporates the objections that Stan Terman had to advanced directives. Have you talked to Stan about this at all? I've often thought about calling Dr. Terman and I've read a whole bunch there of his material. <laughs> it was, I'm sorry? There you are. You're off yeah, We're together now. I've <laughs> often thought about uh, uh, calling him and I've read a lot of his materials. And of course, I read tons of stuff from an awful lot of people. Uh, I would be delighted to talk to you. I think it's really important that you bring the best advanced directive into uh, court uh, because it's you, that's the premise of Bob, what you're trying to advocate. I applaud your efforts, and uh, if there's some way I can help, please let me know. I I, I absolutely will the next time it occurs to me. But okay. one of the one of the things that I'm convinced is going on in in the opposition to using uh, the discontinuation of feeding and hydration in the case of dementia is that judges, the only, in the only case, I mean, there's only one case I know of where this was argued. Um, it was in Colorado and the, the judge, uh, I believe from just reading the arguments, not from reading what the judge ruled, but he, he seems to have gone in the direction of thinking, well, maybe I would allow, maybe I would rule that the person can have advanced uh, uh, SED by advanced directive the husband was the was was the surrogate, and the husband was there arguing for it, and the husband was the plaintiff in the lawsuit. It was a perfect situation, as as I would see it, for pursuing this legally. But except for this one thing, there was not any written evidence that the wife would have wanted the discontinuation of manual hydration and feeding. The 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 husband who was the surrogate said, I know that's what she would have wanted. He testified to it in court and so forth. But a, do, a, a judge could reasonably have been thinking, I, I just can't go there because her advanced directive doesn't specifically say anything about discontinuing a hydration and feeding. Right. Is this the Nora Harris case you're, you're referring yes. to? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that was a tra yeah. tragic case. Uh, it's getting very close to three o'clock. I think our speakers will agree to stay for 15 or 20 more minutes, but technically our program ends soon. But I just want to say, it seems to me that there are several laws that could happen that would alleviate this problem. One is to change the current Oregon model so that six, the six month criteria would not apply to people with dementia, so that they could ask for help in dying uh, before that time when they reach uh, the time that they want to die. The other thing is to change the method of administration, which now is self-administration, to a lethal injection in case of dementia, because many of these patients cannot feed themselves. And the third thing, which I don't think is in our uh, law in California, is that a person has to be competent at the time that the drug is administered. And uh, that's not uh, 
may, that would not help. And these suggestions were made by one of our members, Ralph Schaefer, who was a former college professor and uh, has been trying to make this to the general public, published an article about this in the LA Times, which was very well received. We have to change our laws because this dementia problem is amazing. The other thing that can happen is if there were uh, a, a, a voluntary, if there were an advanced directive for euthanasia, which is AED, uh, advanced euthanasia directive, if there were euthanasia, first of all, and then advanced euthanasia directive, which they have in Holland and Belgium, which Colin mentioned before, uh, that would help a lot. So there are ways to change the law that I would predict in 10 years, we will definitely have them because we cannot put up with this problem of having people who have dementia wanting to die and not being able to. So with that, Barry, did you want to say something to close the meeting and then we can stay? Anybody who wants to stay for another 15, 20 minutes, especially our speakers, of course. Uh, and we've, we've ignored all these chat questions and people with their hands raised and everything because of our time constraints. So I'm sorry, but maybe we can discuss this more informally uh, as after the meeting is officially closed. Faye, can I answer a question I see written from uh, Gisela Lauer? Sure. Um, it's not as expensive to come to care to try to carry out the uh, final exit network uh, sad the supplemental advanced directive for dementia as you might think because first of all we're assuming that that the that the uh, surrogate is not going to be paid you uh, made the comment that it's going to be expensive to pay the surrogate the lawyer the court process etc and it may be unavailable to ordinary people. It may be unavailable to ordinary people, but I don't think that's gonna happen very often. The surrogate shouldn't cost anything because it's a loved one and is not getting paid. The loved ones are Lawyer not the best surrogates always, by the way, Rob, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the lawyer is not gonna cost anything and the court process is pretty minimal when you, uh, have a basically have a free lawyer. It's the lawyer that usually makes the court process so expensive. Although there's going to be a filing fee, two hundred to four hundred dollars, someplace in there to file a, a petition. There could be some other out-of-pocket costs that have to be paid, but uh, I don't think that using the VSED, uh, the SAD program, is going to be beyond the reach of most people. Well, but Final Exit Network is willing to pay for this litigation. That's right. And I want to say, Rob, I'm sorry to monopolize this, but David Hoffman, the attorney, was on Zoom the other day saying litigation is not the best way to go. It should be negotiation between uh, you, say, and the hospital administrator, because once you get a bad court decision, um, there's no way around it. We've had that argument before when you uh, took the case to the Florida Supreme Court. But what do you think about that? Um, every, everything on earth that involves going to court to try to establish, uh, to try to expand the law is always, there's always the argument there. It's always made by somebody. When I was with the ACLU, occasionally I found myself making it with regard to some things. It's just an argument that's out there and needs to be addressed on a case by case basis. And in this particular case, there's absolutely no right. There's no I don't see any potential harm by having a, a bad precedent because that's no worse than what there is now. There's no right to get v said by advanced directive. Can I ask, can I ask whether during v said people are usually sedated or are they expected to go through it without any extra medication? Oh, no, it, it, it the, the, uh, the sad very emphatically calls for every reasonable palliative care. No, nobody, no, nobody in the healthcare field would uh, tolerate having, being involved in somebody going through VSED. I, I think Carl will tell you the same thing, VSED without good palliative care. It's indispensable. That's I agree. But not sedated. I mean, not to, not to the point of sedating somebody, but to make them comfortable and to alleviate some of the symptoms of pain, nausea, sleeplessness, 
at uh, some point it could very well be like the terminal sedation that, that it takes place elsewhere, but yeah. it, it would only be at the very end. Right. And honestly, I find that that's rarely necessary, but I, I mean, you do, I mean, to some extent, you want to sedate them to a level of comfort, not necessarily unconsciousness. And those first few days, usually it's thirst is the main symptom that people complain of. And then, you know, maybe after a while they get a little starvation ketosis and, and, and that actually makes them feel a little bit better. But certainly, um, you know, benzodiazepine meds like Ativan, it's the kind of stuff we use in hospice all the time, um, can help you sort of drowse through those first few days. What's, what's the average duration from starting VZ to dying? How many days? My, my experience, probably like 12 days. As much as that. I, I thought it was about, if you completely stop fluids, particularly if you're not in very good health, I thought it was about five days or so. That's, that would be unusual unless they were already kind of dehydrated to begin with. But, but yeah, 10 to 14 days, typically. I don't know what other clinicians on here, Stan's nodding his head. Uh, that's been my experience. But there's another issue too. The, the SAD contemplates, and you hear this, you know, in discussions about this problem, that if the patient actually does anything that seems to be militating in favor of uh, being uh, fed or hydrated uh, manually, if they communicate that enough to be clear that that's what they want, and especially if they begin to appear to be agitated, it would be so wrong to not let them have uh, what they express this need for at the moment as a basic element of palliative care that um, even my sad says, if that happens, then by all means do what needs to be done. And that would prolong the dying process. It could even just end it for the time being. Yeah, but that's one of the beauties of VSET is that you get the opportunity to change your mind. Whereas if you jump off a building, you know, once you're off it, it's like, oh shit, you know. But surely the whole point of VSET is that your mind has already, by the, by the time you're demented, uh, you're not the person you are. Your mind has already been changed. And the whole point of an advanced direction is you're saying, I don't want my mind at that point to influence what people do to me. I've already made my decision. I made right. it when I was well and sane, and thank you very much, and I'd like to keep it that way. And I, right. I think I was, talking, the, I was talking more about somebody who, who had decision-making mm -hmm. capacity, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Carl, can I ask you a, a quick question? You, you had mentioned that one of the difficulties uh, with these advanced directives is that, you know, people, when they get dementia, are different people than when they were healthy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they make the request to stop eating and drinking at a certain point when they're healthy. And then, uh, you know, the doctors say uh, in these nursing facilities and other places, say, well, you know, this person in front of me is not the same person. They're actually asking for to be fed or whatever. And I'm just wondering why the medical community in general is so, it seems out of line with other uh, areas because you know, we have, if somebody is declared mentally incompetent uh, and then they say, after they've been declared mentally incompetent, uh, I want to, um, I don't know, uh, walk in the middle of a freeway. Uh, we don't, we don't say, well, they're a different person now. So, you know, we need to, we need to kind of let them do what they feel like now because they're a different person. And we, we, we automatically discount that because we know they're incapacitated. So why was it, why would the medical profession continue to, to, to give us this notion that they're, they're a different person when, when we don't allow that thinking or reasoning in any other area when people are declared incompetent, mentally incompetent? Yeah, that's a really complicated question. I think part of the reason is, again, because feeding somebody, it's not like, you know, going and playing in traffic or, or you know, spending your life savings on a, you know, lottery ticket or something. I mean, it's basic human sustenance, right? So it's, for a lot of people, that's really, I think, the, the rub here is that, uh, uh, you know, if somebody says, I want to eat, how are you going to not feed them? And I, I kind of get that, right? Um, I, I, I would be personally conflicted um, if somebody said, you know, I'm hungry, please feed me. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be judging somebody else's quality of life. And, and just like, you know, people who, um, 
be, you know, have a spinal cord injury, let's say now they're quadriplegic and they're like, I don't want to live like this, but yeah, you know, then they live like that. And then suddenly, you know, they're writing books and, and all these kinds of things. So people do sort of change their minds. But again, if you've got advanced dementia, you really, there's no real mind to change. But um, if you're relatively enjoying your quality of life and, um, you know, to me, if you're indifferent to feeding, then I, then I wouldn't feed the person. But if the person is affirmatively saying, please feed me, I have a hard time not following. That's just me. Um, but you say, you say, Carl, that you, it's basic human caring and you would do that because it, it's basic human care. My stepfather had Alzheimer's and he was in a facility. And every time I would come to visit him, he would plead with me to let him go home. That he, he would plead with me, uh, you know, he just wanted to go home so badly. And, you know, I could have used the same logic you're using, which is, well, he's a different person now. And, and he really thinks he can live at home, even though every time he came home, he would wander around the streets and he would get lost and fall down and end up in emergency rooms. So I guess I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that basic human caring notion, why it, why it, is so compelling in that setting you're talking about and not, not compelling. It's just, I think it's Rebecca Dresser in her papers when I yeah. first heard her 15 years ago, it made me furious. I That's was where it started. Well, it, yeah, that, that you would not, I mean, do exactly what Barry said. The now but self I, versus the then self. But but I mean, I I feel like if somebody really says, look, I really don't want to be fed no matter what I say, um, that's something you'd want to at least consider. Um, and uh, I don't think these answers are, are, are clear cut. Um, the same thing in Holland and Belgium when we have uh, euthanasia for demented patients and they seem happy. Like Mrs. A, this test case that went before the um, courts in, in Holland, but her family knew what she wanted, her husband knew what she wanted, they sort of held her down and so she got the lethal injection. Can I? I think I think that theory is not going to hold water in court. That you're a different person and blah blah blah. But we well, have a lot of questions. It doesn't and have questions. to hold in court. It has to hold with the, in the pen of the physician, and that's the problem. The physician won't write the order, and the whole issue has been confused because Rebecca Dresser, you're right, Faye. She started it. Is was not was not a clinician. And so when you refer to something vaguely, when I reach the stage of when I am demented or a little better, when I reach the stage of advanced dementia, that's not good enough. As Carl pointed out, some people, when they reach the stage of advanced dementia, even are still content and are still happy. And some are really suffering. And so your advanced directive has to capture the suffering, and if it doesn't, it's not an adequate event, the uh, advanced directive. By the way, a year ago, Rebecca Dresser reversed her position and oh. said when she when a patient gets to the place where nothing more can be done for them that's a benefit and, and a few other criteria, then it is okay to just provide. Yeah. You don't have to sustain their lives. I can send you the quote if you like. That's good. It became only, it took 30 years <laughs> to get the definition correctly. <clears throat> because what these people had been arguing previously was here's a, a patient who can still throw a frisbee, even though he can't talk, but he's got a smile on his face. He's he lost words, but he still has fun. You don't want to kill a patient like that or yeah. allow a patient to die. Yeah, Atkins, too. Uh, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that's right, actually. I think, I think most people uh, feel that when they get to the point where even if they appear to be happy, if they, are, if, what, if, if they can no longer do the things, think and talk the way they used to do, have sensible conversations, particularly the case with people who value their intellects, people like us, actually, and again, I think we have to bear in mind that we are a tiny minority of the general public, which is why the majority of doctors tend not to like our views. <laughs> but we're only, even in Holland, only about four or five percent of people take advantage of the euthanasia laws. The number will, will increase. 
but I, I, I do not want to be remembered as a sort of person who's a sort of happy, uh, demented person who laughs at anything, who laughs at jokes that normally I'd turn my nose up at. Uh, I'm, I'm the sort of person I am now. Those of us who are on the mic have all the advantages of asking questions. But Greg, you have a lot of questions there. I can't see the questions this time, but maybe you can call in a few people before we hang up. And uh, uh, just about all the questions have been asked, Faye. But I oh, do I, have a question for Rob. Uh, Pat wanted to know uh, at what stage of dementia would would Finn uh, deny services or refuse services? It's described in detail in the uh, in the SAD document in the Supplemental Advanced Directive. For it's a real question. This is a different question, I think, Rob. That's being asked when when you say that final exit will help people end their lives while they're still competent. I think the question is, at what point won't they help? I don't that's think exactly, that that's exactly the question. You know, there's there are scales, published scales that people have put out. You know. Dementia level one, two, three, four, all the way up to seven, I believe. Yeah. There's a there's a medical evaluation committee at Final Exit Network, and I've never discussed that with them enough to be able to 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 tell you the detail that they apply. But it, it, every case is reviewed by a, a medical evaluation committee consisting of three healthcare professionals. Um, I wanted to say though, I I have a um, something happening that's going to cause me to turn into a pumpkin in about five more minutes. And oh, I, I really would like to hear Carl, Carl Steinberg's uh, dementia joke. No, it's, it's not a dementia joke. It's a palliative care joke, but OK. Palliative care joke. <laughs> I'm going to make it quick. So uh, uh, this um, oncologist goes up to the intensive care unit to see his 96-year-old patient who also has end-stage renal disease, uh, advanced COPD, and metastatic colon cancer. And he goes to her room, and she's not in the room. And so he goes out to the nurse's station and says, nurse, where's my patient? Uh, she says, oh, I'm sorry, doctor. Uh, you know, we lost her. What do you mean you lost her? Well, she died, you know, she had a cardiac arrest. We did CPR on her and, uh, you know, she didn't pull through. Well, but where is she? Well, she's down in the morgue, doctor. So anyway, he rushes down to the morgue and he, and he says to the morgue attendant, where's my patient? And, and uh, the morgue attendant says, oh, I'm sorry, the nephrologist came down here to, sorry, he says, he says, uh, I blew the whole joke. Uh, so he says, uh, where's my patient? I got to give her her chemo, right? <laughs> okay. Well, they, they put nails in the coffin just to keep the oncologist out. The morgue attendant says, sorry, the nephrologist already took her up to dialysis. So anyway, then that's <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, there you go. Right. <laughs> hey, hey, Faye, this is Gary. Um, a couple of days ago, I was on a Zoom call with uh, Thaddeus Pope and another medical ethicist and asked them what would happen in, in the institutions where you work as, on these committees for hospitals and so on, if Rob Rivas gave you a call and said, you know, this person with the SAD, uh, you're pushing back, you're, you're not honoring it. And they consulted with each other and they said, at the very least, it would focus their attention, stop the process entirely, and um, open um, discussions. So just the threat of that might be worth, uh, you know, something. We hope so. Sad. And their lawyer stands to make a lot of money if he fights me to the death. So they're going to go to their lawyer and quite often their lawyer is going to tell them that it's absolutely right to ignore Rebus and, and that's when the fight again. We hope not, Rob. <laughs> Anybody have any urgent questions? It's, um, yeah, Jenny had a question. I don't know if she's still here. We can, do you know what the question is, Pat? Yeah, how can the final exit network provide inert gas hood slash supplies in states where assisted suicide is not legal? Final exit network does not provide the means under any circumstances. That's not, that's not the issue. The issue is final exit network will tell people how to do it themselves and be there with them in any state, where, whether in, uh, the Oregon law is legal there or not legal. And, and we also tell uh, the client 
the exactly where and how to get everything they need. But we don't deliver it. It's, it's, once, it's, once we it's provide the means. of assisting in a suicide if you provide the means for somebody. Right. right. Or, that broadly, or if physically you, help if them. You just, if you just go down the street to a store and pick up a, a rubber tube and bring it back and the person uses it, you've provided the means. Final Exit Network very emphatically never does that. Right. We, we provide only education and uh, um, emotional support and counseling. Gary, Gary Wiener's band is a member of our board of directors. And I'm one of the founders. I have a comment. I am appalled that there are some people here who are speakers who said they are so soft hearted that if somebody wants food, they would give it to them. I would expect all of you to be absolutely uh, cognizant that a person was in their right mind and that they don't want to be fed and you would go along with it. And I think it's really awful that some people say, well, I don't know if I could resist it. What's the matter with you? You have, <laughs> what is the issue? I don't see the issue. Here. The issue is if I say, when I'm rational, don't feed me. When I'm not rational, don't feed me. And I'm gonna be very angry if you do that. <laughs> okay, Carl. I won't feed you, okay? I promise I won't feed you, but I-, but you I, just, I It was I, you. You just said you would. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm saying if you're in a nursing home, I don't think that's they're going to be able to follow it. But, uh, but I, I mean, I get what you're saying. I just have personal ambivalence about it. I'm just being honest. Oh, I hope you will not be around when I need it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I promise. I will never force feed you. Okay, I, I will never force feed not you. Not force feed you. I don't want you to I'm come back and haunt my ass. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've mean, seen examples on on Zoom where somebody's at the snack bar and wants a bag of potato chips, even though they have an advanced directive saying no. And it um, looks like cruelty to, to prohibit that from happening. So Natasha, I'll just tell people that uh, if, they, if they provide any hydration for somebody who's asked for it after signing a SAD and being in a in, uh, uh, healthcare institution with the SAD in place, that they should expect to be haunted and tortured after they die by Natasha Josephowitz. <laughs> I have a friend who is a lawyer and we went through visa. They, he and his wife joined Final Exit Network and they were using the advanced directive that we had at that time. And on his fifth day through this journey, he said, honey, can I please have a beer? And she said, no, no beer, sweetheart. And that was his only complaint. <laughs> I, I have a practical question about home care workers who might be, um, you know, helping the dying person who has opted for VSED. Are practically speaking, will they abide by the the wishes of the dying person if a loved one um, cannot be with that person? I uh, was no. at the uh, uh, um, has a process of dying friend. of a very <laughs> famous bioethicist who made it extremely clear that he, like his mother, wanted to die by visa. And he was not demented, but he had mild cognitive impairment. And about midway through his, uh, it turned out to be 12 days, he went over to the refrigerator and drank a quart of orange juice. And everyone in the room was pulling out their hair, like how long is this gonna last? And the caregiver, so we thought we would withhold food and fluid from him. And the caregiver said, that is against my religion. That is a sin. I'm not going to go for it. And he had the ability to call Adult Protective Services. So I sat down with him for quite a while. And we finally came up with a compromise. You know, the reason he's going to the refrigerator is because he's agitated. That is a psychiatric symptom. And he needs a sedative, a sedative for that, anti-anxiety medication for that. Is that okay with your religion? It was okay with this religion. And so <laughs> even Neff, you had your hand up for hours, and so is Tom Sterling. Well, I can you hear me? Yeah. I I just had to say about the caregiver perspective and advocate and end of life doula stuff that I do. I do respect their wishes, and if they have chosen to use V said, and I've been there that is their choice so whatever choice my clients make it is my 
re my duty to respect those wishes. Now, mm -hmm. as Carl will tell you, and I think which is what he was trying to make to the other lady, is he has to also respect himself and he has to respect the laws of whatever institute he's in, which I have to be careful. So it's also much easier if the person is at home for me to help them choose visa. Whereas if they are in a facility, it's often not an easy place to do that. So um, as Karen Van Dyke wrote in the, um, in the chat box, a good placement person can help you with those types of things. So you have to know who your advocates are and, and what they will help you with and who they can go to and what the resources are ahead of time. That's my answer. Tom, sorry. Tom Sterling. My God, he's, he's left. He's maybe they, uh, is. Do you think it's a, a time to maybe uh, let people drift off if they so choose? I I think oh, sure. people can drift off whenever they want to. Yeah. We're a free country here. Yeah, <laughs> you can drift off an hour ago for that matter. But by all means, it's our speakers that I think they want to pick on. So that's up to them if they want to stay. Carrie, you've had your hand up. It looks very persistent to me. I don't know. Oh, you're you're muted, Carrie. Okay, how's that? Yeah, good. Um, if somebody is in a facility with dementia presumably they would be in a memory unit. If they're close to death, doesn't hospice supersede what the facility would do? And it's my understanding that once hospice is brought in, whether, they're, whether the person with dementia is at home or in a facility, that hospice, once they step in, the existing staff steps back and becomes a supportive staff and hospice is more in charge and if there's a, any kind of advanced directive made hospice is much more um likely to insist on its enforcement that's correct that's what happened my uh, i think hospice is just in a better with my husband to make these decisions than facilities Okay, here's the just don't want to mess with anything. I was going to give us the authoritative answer here. So it's a good question. Here's the issue with that is that, you know, hospice is there for an hour, a couple times a week. Um, and the facility staff is there 24 seven providing all the, you know, hands on custodial care for the most part. So hospice has a, a care plan that I would say often kind of supersedes the care plan for the facility. If it's a nursing home, they have to work together. But if that care plan is don't feed a person who can eat, that's probably not going to be followed in a nurse. And, you know, same thing for hospice. Hospices are federally funded too, and they're not going to want to run afoul of that, you know, 1997 federal regulation. So, um, you, you know, there's ways around it. People start to have difficulty swallowing toward the end. And if, there, if, if there's a significant aspiration risk, you can give NPO orders, meaning nothing by mouth. Um, but you know, somebody has to be actually showing signs of aspiration, like coughing when they swallow and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, I hope that answered your question. I think hospice, having somebody on hospice makes these things a lot easier. Carl, is it like this in, at Cullen? I mean, is it like this in, in England? Well, I, um, I, I was uh, going to reply to the, uh, the point made by uh, Dr. Terman that First of all, my book was written for primarily for British audience and British law. And I'm quite sure that nothing like that um, could happen in, uh, in the average British nursing home. I think you could do it in your own home, but I think we would have all the same problems that even if you had a very clear direction, uh, it, it would be quite difficult to carry out however, however clear it, it, it was. But I mean, the, the, the examples I used in the book I, were given to me by um, organizations in Britain that provide advanced directive. I, I didn't write them. They're the, the best advice I, I could get. But I, as I say, I have been trying to establish the legality of sedating someone who wants to die by VSED 
um, but I was thinking more of people who, were, who still had capacity. But I think if someone says, when I get to a certain point, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like not to be fed, I think they wouldn't mind very much if, if, uh, if you sedated them heavily from, from the first day. Because if people are heavily sedated, they don't drink. And the less they drink, the more quickly they die. I mean, I, I, I think if you, if you completely stop all fluid, uh, you're still likely to die within, within a week. The trouble is people, uh, people give oral hygiene, which is more than just keeping the mouth moist. They, they inevitably give small amounts of fluid. And the more fluid you give, the longer they, they last. So I, I can't see the objection to using generous sedation. And I think uh, for a patient with capacity who wanted to be said, I think they'd like to be able to say their final goodbyes, use up their, uh, their carefully designed last words, go to sleep and not wake up. Yes, it sounds good. Does that happen, Carl, in your nursing homes? I don't think so. Well, yeah, if people are on hospice and they're, and they're doing VSAD and they've got some other, you know, uh, chronic serious illness, then yeah, I mean, they get medicated and they- Pretty early on. What's, what'd you say? Pretty early on. Uh, it depends on what you mean by pretty early on. Um, there. Oh, oh, the, no, they start the meds right away. I mean, uh, as soon as a person's on hospice, I mean, why, those first few days are the roughest days, right? Um, for most people, the second and third day. So if you can give a bunch of Ativan so that they can sleep through most of it and maybe wake up a little bit uh, and, and communicate, but then go back to sleep, all yeah. the better. That's a much more- Yeah, that seems, that seems very sensible. Mm -hmm. Pat Green has had a question for a long time. Can uh, you let her ask it? Um, I think I put it on the chat, and right now I can't find it. So which is it my... it's, was... The question was, what should people who have older ADs that specify that two doctors must certify an absence of cap capacity? Oh, just do a new one. It's a piece of cake. Just download one, get a couple of neighbors to, well, during the pandemic, it might be a little more challenging, but uh, yeah. yeah, just redo it. Yeah, that's that's an old one, huh? <laughs> yes, it is. But yeah, you want to revisit them every decade, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you. I see Karen Van Dyke's name is mentioned here. We always give her credit for starting our death cafes here in San Diego. Karen, are you here? Anyway, your name has been honored. I am, Faye. Oh, good. <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, hey, I wanted to just say one other thing. Since we were talking about uh, hospice patients and dementia, um, it, and this is Hunt reminded me of this, is that um, people with dementia, you have to be very far advanced uh, to, to qualify for hospice. In other words, to have a six-month mm -hmm. life expectancy. And normally, they, they want like a, what they call a fast scale 7B which is probably just a matter of a few words in an average day, otherwise nonverbal, uh, you know, unable to do basically any of your activities of daily living. Um, so that's, that's pretty late in the game uh, for hospice. And the other thing is some of these uh, dementia directives will use uh, a fast scale rating as the criterion. And I think that's, it's very different for different people. So I, I to some extent that's unfair to uh, to just go arbitrarily by a, by a particular stage of what you can and can't do or how well you communicate. Anybody else have any pressing questions before we let Colin go to sleep and um, everybody else go to dinner or whatever you're going to do today? This was really wonderful. To, thank you very much, Colin. Very fine and afternoon. Rob and Carl from all parts of the place to come and join us and give us your learned opinions on things. And Stan, thanks for dropping in. And everybody else, thank you for staying and asking your very good questions and being patient if your question did not get answered, which I apologize for. So on behalf of the board of the Hemlock Society of San Diego, goodbye and come to our next meeting, which will be a film on. Um, thank you so much for this meeting, it was terrific. Good, thank you. We'll see you at the next one. Goodbye from Spain. Oh, yes. Adios. <laughs> and from Sorcerer. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, very much for coming. <laughs>